Welcome to online worship at Centenary United Methodist Church. We're glad you chose to be with us wherever you are. May you experience the presence of the risen Christ. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Welcome to Centenary United, United Methodist Church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's good to see all of you today. Greetings, Greetings to those who are following us online and those who are listening to us on the radio. We're glad to be with all of you today. Please remember, Please remember to silence your cell phones as we begin our service. Make sure you read all of the announcements in the bulletin because we don't have time to go over them all during the service. There is, there is a response card in your pew for you to fill out, out if you are a first-time visitor or guest. On one, one side, the other side, place, place for you to put prayer requests and other types of requests for assistance. And just put these on the offering plate later, later in the service, service or you can use your phone and scan the QR and do that online. There will be a Stephen minister at the altar at the conclusion of the service for anyone who would like prayer. Family Skate Night is coming up this coming Thursday night, the 17th at 5.30 at Rollerland. We hope you'll be able to be there for that. Gala tickets are available one more day, right? Tomorrow, Mary, and then that's, we're closing it off because we have to give a total in to our caterer, $20. Come by the office if you would like some. Uh, Karen Cook's Cinnamon Bun Sale will be on December the 2nd and December the 9th from 2 to 5 if you want some cinnamon buns for the holiday season. Oaks Road Book Drive, and where are you, Gail? Come talk to us about the book drive. Good morning. Since 2016, Centenary has partnered with Oaks Road Academy in our C4C Program. C4C stands for Congregations for Children, which means a lot of the Methodist churches in North Carolina partnered with a public school. Oaks Road, if you don't know anything about them, is a school of poverty. Every child has free lunch, every child has free breakfast, every child has a snack. And that has been a real mission for Centenary is to provide things for the children and the teachers uh, at Oaks Road. So next Sunday, we are having our book donations. Everybody should bring one, five, 10, 25 books that you would be glad to donate to a child at Oaks Road. New books are the best. And somebody's like, well, what does a kid need a new book for? Everybody's got books. Well, no, if you, live in the Oaks Road District, no you don't. And when you think about the fact that if a mama has to choose between a loaf of bread or a brand new book, you know what they're going to have to choose. It really isn't a choice. So we have donated in the last few years enough books for every child at Oaks Road to go, we put the books in this huge room and they go in by classes and they pick out the book that they want. And if you could see those little people holding those books to their hearts and saying, oh, this is mine, I can keep it, I can take it home, amazing. I will tell you one brief story. Back after I retired from being a counselor, I worked with kids that didn't speak English very much. So I had gotten a little boy who spoke only Spanish. And I was working with him, trying to teach him some English words. Well, it was the book donation time. So we were in the cafeteria and all the children are looking around. I'm going, oh gee, he doesn't know what all this is about. He doesn't know the words. So I'm walking around going, book, book. And so then some other kids, I talked to them. And when I looked, he had chosen a book. And so he came to me and handed me the book. And I thought, well, this is nice. He's found a pretty book. I opened the book and it was a book that spoke to you and it was in Spanish. So out of the 500 books that happened to be there that day, that child had the one book that was, and I thought, mm, Gail, somebody else is here besides me. And you know, I just feel that way about what we do for Oaks Road. So I hope that you will 
be kind enough to bring however many books you want to bring, and they'll be put on tables here. And then we will take those books to Oaks Road, and they'll be distributed to the kids uh, later that week. So we would appreciate anything that you can do to help the students and the faculty of Oaks Road. Thank you. Well, I mentioned the gala earlier, and then the following Sunday, next Sunday, our guest preacher will be our Bishop Leonard Fairley, and we're coming to the end of our celebration of our 250th anniversary. Throughout the year, we have also had uh, guest music directors and guest musicians. Today is no exception. Today, we welcome Bill Weiser, and Richard, if you would like to come and say a few words. We've come to the end of our celebration, but not the end of our celebrants. Today, Bill Weiser is with us, and it's through the vision, the thought process of Pastor Susan that Bill came to us. 11 years ago, or a little after 11 years ago, Pastor Susan said, we need a direction we need a vision for the music ministry. Bill had recently retired at Edenton Street United Methodist in Raleigh. She called Bill and said, we need you. Bill said, great, I just retired. Find somebody. I'm in Raleigh, you're in Newburgh. <laughs> Bill was with us from 211 to 212. And in that one year, Bill set in motion that vision. Bill, will you join me? <coughs> Bill. <laughs> Bill. In that one year, he set in motion that vision that has continued to go on. In the two rehearsals that we had with Bill, I understand why he did that. Bill, we thank you for your vision. We thank you for your work, your hard work. Bill was the one that found Paul. <laughs> It is, again, it is good to see all of you this morning. You were invited here today, whether you know it or not, by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit invited you, God has something in store for you today. God bless you.
the screen and I invite you to stand now if you're able. Notice that you begin this call to worship because it starts with the bold print. So start when you're ready. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He will judge the people with righteousness and defend the cause of the poor. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The mystery of the ages is revealed. The eternal plan of God is known to all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Let us kneel before him to give him honor, glory, and praise. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Let us offer him all the treasures of our hearts and our lives. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Our hymn is number 127. 127. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
and that is November the 10th. Do we know what November the 10th is? It's the Marine Corps birthday. So, so we want to say happy birthday, Marines. I bet we've got a few with us. Yeah? yeah. Happy birthday, Marines. And, and Well, well, no, Marines are Marines and soldiers are soldiers. Um, but, but, so we do want to say happy birthday, Marines. The Marines are 247 years old. And do you know what is older than the Marine Corps? Your church. What? Your church is 250 years old. And this is when I remind all of your parents that tomorrow is the last day to get those gaffer tickets. And, and the next week is Christmas. <laughs> I did not know that, and I have <laughs> love that you are seeing all the room. Okay, so very quickly, we are going to get down to brass tacks, and I'm going to read you our passage today. Our passage comes from Paul, who is writing, it is about her, uh, and he is writing to uh, followers of Jesus, and he says to these followers, the Thessalonians, he says, we hear that some people in your group refuse to work. They do nothing. And they busy themselves in other people's lives. We command those people to work quietly and earn their own food. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we beg them to do this. So what do, what do we think the tone of this is? Is Paul happy? <laughs> I don't think Paul is happy. And Paul is saying, you know, we need these people to do good work, right? Do you guys, have you ever been in a project where you felt like maybe you were doing all the work and folks weren't helping? Maybe siblings make you feel this way? It's, it's tough. So we want to do good work with kindness and with a happy heart, right? And God commands us to do this. Wonderful. Let's bow our heads and say a little prayer. God, please help us never to become tired of doing good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to go to church. What, baby? It was a really quick prayer. All right.
Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed, let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Our first reading from the Old Testament lesson comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as, the firm, as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Please stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up your, for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We have to talk about it because Jesus talked about it. Next to the kingdom of God, Jesus talked about money more than anything. He said money and possessions connect our spiritual life <clears throat> in ways that we can't really anticipate or understand. We may try to separate our faith and finances, but the Lord certainly doesn't. This connection is laid out several places in Scripture. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is preaching on the banks of the Jordan. There's a crowd there, and in that crowd there are tax collectors and there are Roman soldiers. And they're there to hear John's call to repentance. And each group asked him, what do we have to do? And listen to what John says to them. To the crowd, he says, you should share your clothing and your food with the poor and the hungry. To the tax collectors, John says... Collect no more than you have to. And to the soldiers, he says, don't extort money from the public and be content with your pay. Each of those answers relates to money and possessions, although that's not what he had been asked about. He had asked about the fruits of repentance. What, in other words, they wanted to know is the evidence that a person's heart has changed. And that's what he told them. So do you realize what that means? It means that our attitude towards money and possessions that attitude is so tied to our transformation that John could not talk about one without bringing up the other. We see this many places in Scripture. Remember the story of Zacchaeus the tax collector, Zacchaeus the wee little man. Do you remember what he said when he saw Jesus? He said, look, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I pay back four times that amount. This is a man who had made all of his wealth on cheating people and on overcharging them. And this new and radical approach to money, this generosity, proved that his heart had been changed. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable about a man who is keeping all of his wealth for himself. He has so much grain 
and his barns are already full that he wants to build more barns to store even more. He wants to retire early and take it easy. And God says this man is a fool, and that very night his life is going to be demanded of him. And Jesus concludes his story by saying that this is how it is with anybody who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Finally, we can also think back to, Luke, to Matthew 19 on the rich young man who came to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor and then follow me. You see, Jesus looked into his heart and could see that he was possessed by his own possessions. And then unless he parted with them, he would never be able to, fo- to follow the living God. But the price was too great for the rich man, wasn't it? He couldn't do it. He, he hung his head and he walked away because he loved his earthly wealth more than he loved his heavenly father. And it's plain from passages of scripture like these and others that there is a fundamental connection between our spiritual life and our financial life. We may try to separate them, but the Lord doesn't. Now, most of us have, have or have had money problems at one time or the other. As we sometimes say, we run out of month sometimes but we run out of money before we run out of month Uh, sometimes we think that it's because we have checks in our checkbook we can keep writing checks but we all know what it is to run tight of money or to have money and we don't know how to spend it jesus offers us a new perspective a fresh perspective on how to think about our finances matthew 6 19 jesus says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and thieves break in and steal. It's a powerful statement if we actually understand it. It can change our lives. Jesus says not to store up treasure on earth. Now this is not because treasure on earth is inherently bad. It's not. It has a purpose. You may remember the Apostle Paul talks about money and the root of evil. And if you remember what he says, he doesn't say money is the root of all evil, does he? Do you remember what he said? Love of money is the root of all evil. Money is just, it's neutral. It's a tool. It's a medium. It's something that we can use to do good or do evil. But the way that it's used can create all kinds of evil. Treasure in itself is not bad. That's not why Jesus says not to store it up, though. He says don't store it up because it won't last. It's temporary. It's perishable. The moths and the vermin can get to your grain stores, your wealth. Thieves can break in and steal your coins. Don't store up treasures on earth, not because treasure is bad, but because it doesn't make any sense to focus your life on something that is temporary. He turns around and then commands in the next verse, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven. Now, that's a little confusing because we try to imagine what does he mean by that? Does he mean we're supposed to somehow or other get our money into heaven with us? No, we know that's not true. He's simply telling us to invest in things that are going to last. He's not against storing up treasure. He's just saying stop storing your treasure in the wrong place. Store it instead in a place where it will last forever. In other words, don't renounce money and possessions. Relocate them repurpose them god wants us to think of our real treasure in life as spiritual not material you see materialism is a lifestyle that focuses on acquiring and using things and ultimately because things pass away it's a joyless slow path to self-destruction the apostle paul has a solution for this Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world, those who have money and possessions, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Paul says, don't locate your hope in things that are going to pass away. Locate your hope only in God, because money and property cannot buy happiness. Now, Paul is not saying that we should live like monks or hermits. That's not what he's saying at all. God delights when we appropriately enjoy the material blessings of this life. It's just that there's a time and place for that, and we're called to use all things in moderation and never at someone else's expense. 
Paul goes on and provides us an alternative. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. And there's our clue to what Jesus was trying to tell us. Be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I believe that Paul, although the Gospels were probably not in written form when Paul was teaching and traveling, Paul had access somehow or other to Jesus' teaching, didn't he? Because it sounds like he's addressing that very passage from Matthew where Jesus says not to lay up treasure on earth but to lay it up in heaven. Paul says, lay up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation in the coming age. And he says, do it by being rich in good deeds. Paul is picking up that theme from the Gospels that we can convert or use this world's treasure into treasure in heaven through good deeds done in Christ-like love, through the kind of sacrificial giving that Jesus demonstrated in his life on earth. It's as if God has opened an account for us in heaven. Now I say as if, it's a metaphor. Please don't think that I'm saying God has literally opened an account for us in a heavenly bank. He hasn't. But it's as if God has opened an account for us. And that account that God opens for us is a gift. It's not a reward. It's not something that we've earned. Paul's very clear when he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. So we shouldn't think that we've somehow earned this heavenly account. But through faith, we are called and led to do good works. Works that God values. And Paul explains that in the following verses in Ephesians. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's why God made us, to through faith do good works, works of love, works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's as if God is keeping track of every act of kindness and compassion that we do. And in this way, through our good deeds, we're making deposits in that heavenly account that God has opened for us. An account that closes the minute that we die because we can only make deposits in it while we are alive on this earth. Again, think of it as a metaphor. It's a way of thinking about it. It's not what actually happens. It's as though we're making deposits in a heavenly account through our good deeds, unselfishly done and unconditionally done. When we use that metaphor to think about treasure on earth versus treasure in heaven... The question is, are we actually making deposits in that heavenly account? Jesus gives us a choice. We can invest our lives in treasures on earth that stay here after we're gone. Or we can invest treasures on earth in such a way that they become treasures in heaven. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have worldly possessions that you can't hang on to or would you rather invest your life and invest your money in doing good that will lead to heavenly treasure that will never pass away the word from the lord on money is very simple if you if anybody ever asks you what does the bible say about money it's very simple you can't take it with you but you can pay it forward you can't take it with you but you can pay it forward And there are really two principles that go along with that. The first one is the most important. God owns everything, and you and I are God's stewards. We're the ones who are called to take care of everything that God owns. What does God own? Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. Did you catch that second part? You may think, well, God doesn't own me, he owns everything else, but no, God owns us as well. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own, you have been bought at a price. God is our creator, and the creatures belong to the creator. It all belongs to God, and you and I manage it for God. Using that banking metaphor again, God has trusted us enough to put our name on what is really his account, So that means we need to be very careful, don't we? Since we are managing someone else's possessions, we need to be careful not to embezzle. We need to be very careful not to misappropriate anything that God has given us because ultimately it all belongs 
to God. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, understood this principle very well. And one of the quotes that I love the most from Mr. Wesley, here's how he put this principle. He says, do you not know that God entrusted you with that money above what buys necessity for your families to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the stranger, the widow, and the fatherless? Do you see what he's saying there? God has given you enough to take care of your own family. And anything that God has given you above and beyond that, God expects you to use to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and help strangers and widows and orphans. Wesley says, Indeed, as far as it will go, that money relieve the wants of all mankind. And then he says this, How can you, how dare you defraud the Lord by applying that to any other purpose? When God has given us more than we need to take care of our own and we use it for any other purpose than taking care of the poor and the hungry and strangers and widows and orphans, Wesley says, in effect, we are defrauding God by misappropriating those funds. Or as Wesley said in another place, not how much of my money will I give to God, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself? A question we ought to ask every time the offering plates are passed around. The question is not how much of my money am I going to put in this offering plate today for God. The question is how much of God's money am I going to return to God? How much of it am I going to give back? It's life-changing to start thinking of your money and possessions in those terms as belonging to God for you to use for God's purposes 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Not successful, faithful. God will deal with the success or failure of it. Our job is to be faithful, to do what we've been called to do. That's the first principle. God owns everything and you and I are God's stewards. The second principle goes along with it. And that is that my heart always goes where I put God's money. In Ecclesiastes 5.12, Solomon writes, The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. In other words, if you have a lot of earthly possessions and a lot of money, you probably don't sleep as well at night as someone who doesn't have that much. Because you're always worried what? About what Jesus said. About losing it in some way about misspending it, about someone taking it from you. And if you're thinking about that all the time, then you're probably going to act in that way. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It will begin to change your heart. A wealthy person cannot rest securely until their treasure is secure. Earthly possessions are always at risk until we give them over to the Lord, and then they are secure in his hands. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If an angel were to come to this world and look in your checkbook, your bank accounts, at your credit card statements, what would that angel conclude about your heart by looking at how you spend your money? Where is your heart? What is important to you? What do you care about? What's your priority in life? Because the way you spend your money and the way you treat your possessions tells the entire story. When we put our money, it doesn't just show where our heart is, it shows where our heart will follow. Because our heart tends to follow what we invest in. People say sometimes to me, you know, Pastor, I really wish I had a heart for missions. And I always have a question when I hear that, because I'm thinking, number one, they're probably trying to tell me that they're not going to be giving or, or working in missions, because they don't have a heart for it. They're waiting for something to happen, like they wake up one morning and all of a sudden now they want to go on a mission trip or they want to give money to missions. Or evangelism. I don't have a heart for evangelism. I don't have a heart for the poor. Jesus tells us exactly how we can develop a heart for missions or evangelism or the poor or fill in the blank. And it's pretty simple. If you want to have a heart for missions, folks, get involved in missions. That's what you do. Get involved in it. Spend some money on it. Invest your time, your talents, and your treasures in something. And guess what happens? Your heart will follow. Your heart follows where your investments go. 
Put your treasure there. Your heart will follow every time. Jesus was speaking flat out truth. The heart goes where the treasure goes. Invest in the kingdom of God. Buy up shares in God's kingdom through generous giving of your time, your talents, and your treasures. Everything belongs to God, but God has turned it over to us to use on his behalf and according to his will. So our question is always, how am I going to use what God has given me to further God's kingdom? You got a letter this past week, many of you, in the mail. Uh, it's your normal letter that you get every quarter with your quarterly statement of giving. We also included this time a letter giving an update on our financial status, uh, talked about some things that we've been able to fund in the last several months, and maybe a couple of things that we have not been able to fund, simply to keep you posted on how we're doing. There was also in there a giving commitment card, because we give these out every year about this time of year. And what this is, is an invitation to you to prayerfully consider how you're going to invest your treasure in the coming year. I'm interested in your time and your talents also. This is specifically about your financial treasures. So if you got one of these cards, please prayerfully consider the ways in which God might be calling you to invest that. If you did not get one, there's some in your pews for those of you who are not on the mailing list or didn't open your mail. And if you're a visitor, always, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't give because I was told one time you never tell visitors that because you might be cutting somebody off who came in there specifically for that purpose. God called them in that day. So whatever God is calling you to today, please prayerfully consider it. There is also a QR code on this as well if you want to do this online. You know, when we get to the end of our life, all of us are going to look back, probably, and we're going to wonder <clears throat> how we should have used what God gave us. You know, we're going to go through that period of regretting. I should have done this, I should have done this, I wish I had done that instead of that. And so a good exercise to go through is to ask yourself, put yourself in the position, you're reaching the end of your life, and you're looking back at how you've lived and ask yourself the question, what do I wish I had done? What do I wish I had invested my life in? And the nice thing about doing that now before you actually reach those last moments of your life is now you still have time to do something about it. Ask yourself the question, what do I think I'm going to regret having not done, having not invested in? And then invest in it. Don't wait any longer because all of us are just like that man who was storing up all the grain and wanting to build more barns. We're not guaranteed another day of life. While you still have breath in you, ask yourself, what am I going to regret someday? And then make sure that you don't have that regret. Jesus tells us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven so that every day, instead of backing away from our treasures on earth, we are moving towards our treasures in heaven. He who spends his life backing away from temporary treasures has reason to despair. She who spends her life headed toward eternal treasures has reason to rejoice. Remember, folks, it's very simple. What does the Bible say about money? You can't take it with you, but you can pay it forward. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be.
screen. Let's say together what we believe. We believe in one God who is creator, maker of all we see and all we don't see, ruler of the universe, source of all creation. We believe in one God who is Jesus Christ, God from God, light from light, true God and true human, one with the creator, the word made flesh, our Messiah, Savior of all creation. We believe in one God who is Holy Spirit, breath of God moving among us, one with the Creator, one with the Christ, our Comforter and our Guide, Mentor of all creation. Amen. You may be seated. As we start our time of sharing, we'll begin with joys and celebrations. And the first thing I would like to do is recognize all the veterans who are in our midst today. We had Veterans Day. So if you are a veteran of the Armed Forces, please stand. All veterans, please stand. To show our appreciation for veterans and serving our I didn't have the opportunity to do it from here last week, but welcome back to Susan and Doug from Maine. It's good to have y'all back in our midst today. Are there any other celebrations? I've got one more in just a minute, but are there any others first? Yes. Thank you, Richard, for reminding us of that. That'll be wonderful. Four o'clock here in the sanctuary. Any other celebrations today? Yes, sir. Our son, Drew Hodges, is visiting today and worshiping with us from Portland, Maine. Okay, good to have you with us. <laughs> Welcome home. Who else? Well, the last of our celebrations today, before we come to our time of sharing concerns, we're going to welcome into membership two new members today. They have been worshiping with us, I think, for about 10 weeks now. If David and Susan Briley could come to the front. And if you'll look at your hymnal to page 34, congregation. Stand here and face you. And I'll start with the do you confess phrase. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Congregation at the top of page 35. Do you as Christ's body the church reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. And now let's flip over to page 38. As members of Christ's Universal Church, will you continue to be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? As members of this congregation, Centenary United Methodist, will you continue to faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let's give them a welcome home to St. Mary United Methodist.
Let me share a few concerns with you as we enter into that time of sharing. Georgie Jackson has been moved to Grantsbrook in Grantsboro if you'd like to go see her. Todd Flowers is at Crystal Bluff and Gail said he is doing much better. We ask for prayers today for Christine Saunders. We have three folks having surgery coming up this week. Sally Arthur tomorrow, Petey Scott Tuesday, and Jim Williams on Friday. We also have a number of people who are still recovering from surgery and those who are looking forward to surgery in the next few weeks and months. I ask for your prayers for Dub Wright, who is very ill. We also lift up our crew at Pilgrimage. We have 17 youth and six adults who will be on their way back today. And it looks from what I've seen on social media like they've had a wonderful and blessed time this week in Rocky Mount. What are our other concerns today? Anyone else have a concern you'd like to lift up before the body? And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we welcome into your presence. We, we come into your presence. We feel welcomed into your presence by your faithful love. We bring our concerns to you and our prayers to you today with confidence knowing that you hear and answer our prayers. We thank you today for the devotion and courage of all those who have offered their service to our country. On our behalf, God, many have entered into danger. They have endured separation from the people they love. They have labored long hours in difficult circumstances. They have borne great hardship both in war and in peacetime. Give to your people grateful hearts and a united will to honor these men and women and hold them always in our love and our prayers until your world is someday perfected in peace and all world, all wars come to an end. We pray for this world that you've created and the people who share it with us. We pray today for countries caught up in violent conflict. We lift up Ukraine and Russia. We pray for our own country and for its people. We pray for our leaders, both those who re remained in office and those newly elected. We pray for our legal system and our, and our, arm, and our armed forces and our law enforcement. We pray for this local community in which we live. We pray especially today for those who are unemployed, for those who are hungry, for those who are homeless. And we pray that you would help us, direct us to help them. And we pray for this congregation. We pray for our own brothers and sisters in Christ, especially for those today who suffer or for those whose loved ones are suffering. Generous God, today we confess that we have sometimes been greedy and focused too much on the things of this world. Sometimes we carry resentment that somebody else has more than we have or has something that we want. Sometimes we long for a security which we wrongly believe only money can give us. Heal us from that, Lord, and redirect our search for security and peace. Help us always to remember that it is you who lend us life and that that life is a gift. Help us to always remember that the purpose of life is always greater than knowing that we have enough for tomorrow. Help us to always remember that our possessions are a gift from you and we are only caretakers, stewards, with the responsibility for the well-being of our brothers and sisters. And help us always to remember that true riches do not lie in abundant possessions, but in being rich toward you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Set our hearts and our minds on what is true and honorable and right. Give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful to the call we've received in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is in his name we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we give in grateful thanksgiving for all that God has given us. In the upside down world of the gospel, we measure our wealth not by what we have, but by what we can give away. Let us now gather our gifts together and return them to God in gratitude and in praise.
While you're standing, please pass the peace of Christ on to your neighbors. If you're a member of this church and you see somebody here today that you don't recognize, welcome them home to St. Mary. Do not worry about anything in life, what you eat or what you wear. Look at the birds of the air, the flowers in the fields. If God takes such good care of birds and flowers, how much more will he care for you? So don't be afraid. Instead, share what you've been given with those in need, storing up treasure in heaven instead of here on earth. And may the blessing of our generous God encourage and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And the children of God all said, Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship today at Centenary United Methodist Church. If you'd like to know more about Centenary, go to www.centenarychurch.com. If you'd like to speak to me or another staff member, you can reach us at 252-637-4181. Or if you'd like to visit us, come to 309 New Street in beautiful Newburn, North Carolina. God bless you, and remember, God loves you.